All right, hello everybody. So I've got a good one for you today, one I've been meaning to do for a long time. We are going to show off the EDS system or more technically do a demo of the Super X EDS system on the Themis here and provide a tutorial for how to use it. And uh, we've got a great sample for this because it's got a bunch of elements in it. And we're going to demonstrate atomic resolution as well as not atomic resolution. And um, we're going to cover a whole bunch of good stuff here. So, so first order of business is let's find the sample. So the sample is a uh, photonic device structure that is a series of uh, quantum wells and they are alternating arsenide based semiconductors and they're surrounded by um, the this active region is surrounded by an indium phosphide matrix so all in all there's five different elements in the material that we can use to map and we can map them um, down to uh, atomic resolution, which is pretty cool. And so this is the structure. This will look a little better when we're in essay mode here. I can show you this. All right, so set you centric height. Can't really tell what this is now, but you will soon, I, I promise. Okay, there we go. So, let me switch this. Okay, let me turn off the circles. So, this material in here, this kind of, it looks like a rectangle, but you can see it kind of gets curved toward the corners. So, this is the active region in here. Everything surrounding this is pure indium phosphide. So, this is the um, alternating layers of indium gallium arsenide and indium aluminum arsenide which you can't really see it at this uh, magnet. Well, actually we kind of can here. I can kind of show you in a minute. But anyways, that's what this is. And this is indium phosphide. So we're gonna actually map um, the border of this so we can include both the quantum wall structure as well as the, um, the matrix. So actually, if you see, if I mag in here, so you can kind of see the, the quantum well structure, right? And this actually has some, some really fine divisions here that are just like a few monolayers thick. So all in all, pretty neat sample to work with. Um, all right, so things we need to do here. So let me quickly check the, um, the monochromator shifts and the C2 aperture. So go to beam, turn off the C3 lens. Okay, I don't have my monochromator tune there because I have the wacko thing with the you know, screen resolution, so I'm going to find it here. Okay, so um, yeah, we want to start at a positive 40 because we're going to be in STEM nano probe to start with here. So I'm going to make sure I'm centered. Eh, we're not too bad, but we're off a little bit, so I'll go ahead and tweak this. And perfect. Okay, so. We should be good as long as we stay in nanoprobe. Although, as you're going to see here, a little bit of a spoiler, we're not going to be in nanoprobe for the entire time. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Um, all right. So let's check the centering of the C2 aperture. And it looks pretty good because I centered it the last time I used it and I didn't mess with anything, so it's still good. All right. So we'll turn on, go back to three condenser mode. Okay, and now the only other thing I'm gonna do here, I'm not gonna do any more alignment in TEM, uh, but I'm gonna get a rough zone axis alignment um, of the area of interest. So let's see, I think it's, what's the best place to do this? Um, either the top 
or the bottom of the active layer. I don't think it really matters one way or the other. So I guess we'll target the top area here. So we want to get well aligned with the zone axis. Okay, so we can see we're a little bit off. Okay, so according to my tilt map, that's a beta tilt. And again, I'm going to probably have to make an adjustment to this once I, um, once I get into STEM mode as well. But for now, we're, that, that's plenty okay. All right, so we're, oops. So somehow we made it to the bottom there by the adjusting the beta tilt. Where are we? Okay, I think we're probably close enough for now. Okay, yeah, we're good enough for now. So again, we'll make a we'll make a tweak when we get into uh, STEM mode. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to pull this out of the way for now. So we start in vacuum, and we're going to find the STEM tab and hit the STEM button. All right, so I have right now, um, I have the spot size defaulted to 10 millirad. Um, if we're going to do atomic res work, we want to use, a, you know, like the same kind of convergence angle range we would be doing normally. So 22, 25 millirad, we can use 22 millirad, that's fine. Um, but this spot size as is, is not going to cut it. Okay, so basically we've got, you know, just under 20 picoamps of current. Really can't do EDS effectively at a current this low. Um, you could do it at 50 picoamps um, if you were very patient. <laughs> Um, and maybe if your sample was kind of on the thick side, this is a little bit of a thicker sample, which is why I kind of chose it, because it's going to give better EDS signal. Um, but even 50 picoamps is kind of low. And, and since we have a CS corrected instrument, we can get higher currents and still have, you know, fairly small probes. So what I'm going to do is, there, well, there's two ways I could do this, okay? I could keep... Um, my gun setting the same, and I could just change the spot size. Okay, so if I go to beam, so every time I decrease the spot number, I'm gonna roughly double the current. So if I go to nine, I'm gonna get yeah about a double, a double. So yeah, so this would be you know a, a good you know 100 to 200 picoamps with the Super X detector is is a pretty good place to start. Um, if we wanted to do a, a rough calculation here, actually, okay, so if we go to measurement, okay, we're going to tell the system we have 22 millirads and we have, you know, 220 picoamps, okay, so it's telling us that we've got a probe that is still, you know, 135 picometers, Right, so that's still really good. still really good, right? For this much, again, because we have the CS correction, right? Just to give you an idea, if I put this back to um, 17, right, we'd be down to sub 80. Okay, so, and this is plenty small enough to do, you know, atomic res analytical work. So, uh, so we'll do this. Okay, we'll we'll go to spot size six. Your other option is, okay, I could have left the spot size at 10. And because I have the fully loaded um, gun here, the XFEG with the monochromator, I could go to monochromator tune and I could just adjust the focus here and see just by adjusting the focus, okay, and not changing the spot size, I can dial in a current, okay? So I could have left it at 10 and done this, right? And just dialed in a current by adjusting the monochromator focus. But I'm gonna put this back to about 40, which is where it was. And um, we'll, we'll leave that B here, okay? Again, both of those would be perfectly valid, okay? All right, so um, now we have to do the stem alignment. So I'm going to turn diffraction off. Okay, there's my probe. 
pull up S core, state of correction, user beam shift with bit multiplier three. And we'll go ahead and center that. Now, one thing I should actually do here too, let me do this now before I forget, is I need to zero the, um, zero the stigmators out. So if we come back to STEM, if you find STEM auto tuning, you can click reset here and that will do that. Um, and then uh, let me push, I mean, I know this is the default eucentric focus, but I'm gonna push eucentric focus anyway, just to put it back and run a normalization. Okay, there we go. All right, so let me go ahead here. Okay, so we can see my caustic spot is not too bad, but I can make it a little better. Okay, and that's good enough. So I'm going to turn diffraction on now. Now, when you have a current that's this high, um, in my opinion, you know, because we're going to manually correct A1 and B2, there's really no need to do this um, A2, B2 auto tuning. I would reserve this only when you're trying to get like that sub 80 picometer stuff. Um, we should have no problem getting an optimized probe with the current this high without needing the auto tuning, in my opinion. Okay. All right, let me bump up the camera length here. Turn on the screen markings, find direct alignments. Go ahead and center the ronchigram here, or the direct disc, I should say. Okay, now we'll find apertures, and we'll put in the 150. Okay, it's basically centered. Okay, so I, I remember when I, the sample was down here and this was vacuum. So if I push the joystick forward, I should come into the sample. Let me bump the mag down here though. So the first thing we should see is the top of the lamella, which should have some E-beam induced platinum deposition on it. And there it is. Okay, so now I'm gonna focus with Z to get uh, a rough blow up condition here. And again, if you have the piezo move, you can do that as well. So I can get this a little bit closer here with the, with the Z. Okay, so you can see there's some two fold there. Let me turn this off to make it a little easier. So ATA1. Okay, that looks good. And then the next thing is gonna be ATB2. So if we find the stigmator panel, we can turn on probe B2. All right, so there's a little bit there, um, not a whole lot though, but we'll go ahead and fix this. So it's kind of going a little bit left to right. So that's up down with the arrow keys. Okay, let me see if there isn't, um, I'm gonna move down here. So sometimes the crystallinity can make this a little tricky. Uh, let's see if there's like a, so this is the indium phosphide now, but I wanna see if there's like a part here. So this is completely amorphous. So it's gonna be a little easier to see here. Yeah, so there's still some B2 there. Okay. There we go. All right, and we got maybe a little still A1. So go ahead and fix that.
Okay, that's as good as we're going to get this with, with course A1. So, all right. So, we're good to go there. Apertures, screen markings back on. And then we'll put the 70 back in. All right, let me center this up here. All right, let me turn diffraction off. Let's see how our, okay. Let me pull down with the joystick till we get over vacuum. There we go. Okay, so, it, I mean, it looks looks centered still, so we don't need to adjust beam tilt. Uh, so we should be good to go here. The only thing left to do is gonna do some um, fine A2 correction when we look at the sample. So, but otherwise it looks, looks fine. All right, so we'll turn diffraction on. Drop our camera length back to 115, like we would do for a normal hat of stem. Okay, and we'll start the scan here. All right, so there we go. Ahead and center up my Ronkygram. Okay, we'll go ahead and maximize this. So we've got a uh, super saturation right now of signals. So let's drop the gain. And we can do the C1A1 auto tuning on the platinum grains. So this actually works really well for this. Um, so we're going to move on here and we're going to go up to, you know, an atomic level of resolution. Okay. We'll do piezo move Z to get us as Okay, so I can start to see the atomic. Yeah, there's the atomic detail. All right, so this should work perfectly. Okay, our detector contrast brightness is set well. Okay, so we'll pause this and run C1A1, and we should be good to go. All right, let's take a look. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. All right, just like that. So just like that, stem alignment is basically done. All right, so, so the crystallographic directions here, um, and you can see the quantum well structure now here a lot better. Okay, so the we're looking along a 110 zone axis, and these are, you know, zinc blend materials. So this is, this direction from, you know, top to bottom, this is 001. So the dumbbells are running like this. So I'm actually going to rotate so this interface is vertical. So I can use, um, I think this actually does, well, actually I can use this anyway. So let me go ahead and click and drag. Okay, and then I can do 90 degree rotate. And there we go. All right, let me go ahead and center that. Now one thing we could do too, so we haven't actually... Um, you know, collected any EDS data. But one of the things we're going to have to to do is figure out um, a dispersion. Okay, so basically when we're collecting EDS data, th this refers to the detectable range of the x-rays. Um, this will go all the way out to 40. I mean, I've never actually done the 80. I mean, I, I guess it's effective, but um, usually 20 is good as a default. But if you know what x-rays you're going to be looking for, right? So the elements we're going to be looking for here um, are, if we go to the processing window, so basically all the ones I have highlighted here, okay? So, you know, indium is going to make the highest energy ones. Um, 
if we right click on this so yeah, we can't detect the K so it looks like the L I mean the L is in the three range if you look at gallium arsenide so this could be detectable um, but actually let's okay so we could actually in this case we could use the K or the L usually the higher energy x-rays or the highest energy that can be detected is usually the way to go so why don't we just um, let's use the 20 here uh, anyway okay and we're just scanning this area right we're not doing any mapping yet but why don't we just collect a spectrum here just to you know see what we get okay so I can go back to my interface I have a super X panel here then I can open up the shutter okay and so actually we can see in the um, in the software here we can actually see some information about the four panels of the super X and you know where I'm getting signal from so you can see like they're all getting good signal um, but two of them are kind of getting a little bit better than the other two so what that tells me is there's probably a little bit of shadowing going on somewhere that you know we're not getting like full detector signal everywhere but you know but we'll make do with it anyway um, okay so this is the acquire so we'll do an acquire here and we'll take a look here and see what we get and so we can see just like we expect uh, so there's the right there's the aluminum come on where are you phosphorus there it is there's the aluminum there's the phosphorus uh, there's the gallium L there's the arsenic L there's the indium L and there's the gallium and the arsenic K and then you're also seeing the you know secondary effects from the molybdenum and so you're seeing the molybdenum signal but the peaks are actually fairly well separated here so um, so these are going to work uh, pretty well for um, doing what we want to do okay so again this is just a survey just kind of telling us what's in here and okay so let's see here should be almost done here we have very low dead time so and is it done yeah so it's done now okay all right so i opened up the shutter and so this will stay open now um i think until we overload it or until we close it so um we'll go ahead and uh you know leave it open here because we're gonna mess with it here anyway we'll go ahead and close this Okay, so now what we have to, to do here is um, get to a spot where the zone axis is good. So we can see as we're scanning here, you know, the zone axis looks like it's better as we go up to the top. So let me go ahead here. So I'm just going to move here rather than, you know, tilt the sample. I'm going to move here and see if I can't just find a good spot. Come on. Yeah, so somewhere in here looks good. Come on. There we go.
All right, so I'm out of focus here, so I'm focusing with the Z. All right, so that's pretty good here. Go ahead and open this up here so I can start to see the atomic res coming through here. Uh, okay, let me go ahead and focus. There we go. Beautiful. Okay, so this should uh, be enough here. Okay, so now here's the... Um, Spectrum imaging, so you want to make sure this is selected for doing drift compensation. This is your area that's going to be used um, for your drift compensation. So we'll go ahead and put this here. Actually, you know, I'm going to move the sample a little bit. Uh, let me switch this. PAs would move Y. Get this a little bit further over. There we go something about like this. So um, what you're seeing, so this is the indium phosphide, okay? This is the in gas, and this is the aluminum, uh, the indium aluminum arsenide right here. Okay, and now from here, all we have to do is tell it, the dwell time, so you you know you want like you know a few seconds per frame, and you want to I don't use auto stop. We'll do this manually, and then we want to make sure we have drift compensation. And yes, we want to do optimize optimize for periodic images in this case. And with that, we are ready to go. So this is going to take a few minutes to work, so we'll have to bear with it. But here we go. Okay, so what I did here, um, up here, I clicked and dragged on this, and this generates now the sum spectrum. And so we can see what peaks we have, which we already know, right? We already know what we have here. Um, and so it's already generating us some maps here. Uh, we can tell it what peaks we want to use, you know, as, as this goes along. Um, so if we look in the case of the... Um, well, in the case of aluminum, right, we don't have a choice. Aluminum is only the K, phosphorus is only the K. Um, but if we look for the other ones, like the gallium and the indium, um, we can right-click on this and we can tell it, um, actually, before we get into that. Okay, so right now, it, the, the maps that it's doing right now is what's called um, an intensity map or integrated, um, integrated intensity. So basically, if we look at the gallium, okay, what it's doing here is um, is it's using the signal in the K peak. So basically right here, okay, it's basically drawing, you know, it's, it's basically integrating over the K peak here and it's using that to generate the map, okay? Um, and so this is what's called an intensity map. So now the problem with these is, um, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, okay, so so the intensity map uh, just generates a signal over a window. The other thing we can do too here, because there's more than one gallium peak here, is we can tell it to. Um, you know, we want to click on here first and then right click. We can tell it to use the L as well for the intensity. Okay, so you can see like I got more signal here for the gallium. Um, 
The problem with this, though, that I find is that this is not very accurate in terms of giving us the most um, spatial accuracy. So what I will do instead, and what's usually preferable, is to switch to a net map. Okay. So we'll get into what that means here in a minute. Um, what I'm going to do here, though, is I'm going to adjust my focus here. So the focus tends to kind of go out a little bit with time as you do this. Okay, so net maps are uh, preferable in my opinion. Um, the reason for that is they um, account for background subtraction and they also account for any potential um, peak overlaps, okay? So if we look here, for instance, right, so you can see this is starting to come through here. Um, I had a filter on though, I'll have to, we'll deal with that in a little bit here. And so we're getting some damage here, but we'll soldier on here. can see the structure coming through here so so i wonder if maybe the dwell time was a little bit long but well, we'll see. See, then if you turn on the the filtering, then it looks looks much better here. Then you can kind of see the atomic atomic resolution coming through there. But we'll again we'll talk about that here. Talk about that in in time as this moves along here. So there's no um, hard and fast rule for how long you need to run the map, right? I mean, it's kind of you know. You can kind of measure the signal here and see, I mean, we're not up to a million yet. Um, not that that's, you know, a, a meaningful number per se, but um, yeah, see, I wonder if, see, we're getting a little bit of damage here. And I wonder if this dwell time was a little bit too long, if it's not correcting quite wet well. so. Um, all right, let me go ahead and stop this. We might make a, a little bit of an adjustment here. I mean, we can play around with this anyway, just to show you. Um, let's see here. Show background windows. Empirical, click auto. All right, there we go. All right, so we can do a little filtering here. Um, so filtering, is, so one of the big things is we can like sum pixels. Um, so this, that's probably the biggest thing that helps here. So um, let's do four. See how that look? Yeah, so that already looks quite a bit better. Um, and then we can do a post filter with a radial, and this works well when you have, you know, crystal material. So if we look now in the maps, so now we can see this is atomically resolved, right? And so is this, so is the indium, so is the aluminum, and the gallium's kind of coming through there, but, you know, we can play around with this a little bit here, and there's, you know, stuff we can do here with the
um, with the filtering to kind of make this better. But let's try um, try this again here. I want to try something else. So maybe the current's a little bit too high. So we can try bumping it down to um, to 100 nanoamps. So what I'm going to do here then is yeah. So we got some got some pretty good damage there. Uh, let me go ahead and just mag out here for a second. All right, let me bump this down to about 100. So fortunately, this is a, you know, a somewhat beam sensitive material. Okay. Uh, let me make sure I didn't bump something here. No, I didn't. Okay. All right. And just go ahead and mag back in. Okay, now when we did this last map here, that was at 582. Uh, let's try going a little bit lower here. All right, let me go ahead and focus here. All right, so let's try this again. We'll try doing 20 microseconds, so the dwell time is a little bit quicker. And we'll see if that gives us maybe a little better result. Okay, so if you do a net map, um, you can only pick one peak, right? So if we're doing, say, gallium, you can either use the K or you can use the L. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. I mean, it, with some of these, you don't have a choice. You only have, like, you know, the, the K to do, so. But so far, this is working out okay. See why these are so so light here. All right, 
right, so we're doing okay. Material still looks good. Uh, how about some uh, some colors here? So let's see. If you want to change the colors here, you can click on this and you can change whatever you want. Usually red, green, blue should be your most important colors. Um, let's do red for the gallium. Oops, we already have that. Um, let's do blue for the indium. After that, it's kind of wishy-washy. So like this, you know, cyan color works good. Yellow is not too bad. And then you also have like this magenta. So um, the yellow is not too bad, though. So we can leave that there. So, so it's not uncommon for, um, you know, a, a decent map to take uh, several minutes, if not, you know, more. Uh, obviously, the longer you can count, the better. Um, you may be limited by damage to the sample. You might be limited by something else. I mean, this sample still looks pretty good right now, so we're going to, you know, roll with it here. If we mouse over this, we can click Modeled. And we can see how it's modeling the peaks. The one thing I also have here with this is I have molybdenum checked but i also have um, i have it set for deconvolution only so basically what that means is it's it's going to account for it if there's any overlaps but it's not accounting for it like when it you know does a quantification or it does like a mapping or something like that so The other thing we can check here is, so the background um, correction is pretty important here. Um, my preferred one to do is empirical um, and to use background windows and then check auto. And then if you right click and then show windows here, you can see um, if any of these look kind of, I'm, so I'm holding shift and then left clicking actually, and then control and then left clicking. If any of these look kind of weird, um, you can, of course, delete them. You can remove them. You can change the, the width of them. So this one looks a little kind of strange here. So I'm just going to put that there. Um, that's kind of an odd place for a window. So we can delete that one. So it's showing the residual there. That's the background that it's, that it's calculating or modeling, I should say. The rest of these kind of look good. Obviously, you want to make sure there's, you know, there's no overlap with the peaks, right? Um, that's why you can change these manually if you want. Some of these are a little, a little close, but not too bad. Okay, so we can start to see it coming through here. And we can start to see the material maybe getting a little bit of damage. Okay, the nice thing about doing this too is you can periodically, you know, fudge with the focus here, which is what I just did slightly. So Okay, but doing this at a hundred PicoAmp seems to have worked a little better here so far. Okay, yeah, so we don't have any filtering on, so that's good. So we're seeing, you can kind of see here that this is, you know, atomically resolving here. It's a little noisy, but again, we have, you know, things we can, things we can do to um, address that once um, we're done collecting the data. Okay, so we can do some filtering with the maps and, and that will help. So again, if I wanted to do um, intensity here, the gallium got like super saturated. What's that all about? There we go. So the, I mean, the, the, the one advantage of intensity is if you have more than one peak, you can have it do both of those. So I can have it add the K and the L for the gallium. Um, 
and I could do that same thing for arsenic and indium. Uh, the problem with those is it doesn't account for background, right? And it doesn't account for peak overlaps. We don't really have an overlap problem here, but the background is the real the real issue here. So you can kind of see with the aluminum, it's showing us we have aluminum where we really don't have any. Um, and that's, you know, kind of a problem. So that's why the, the net is really the, the way to go here. Um, so you get the most accurate uh, map. So far, so good, though. So we can kind of run this until, um, I guess, until we have, you know, too much damage. <clears throat> I'm in the... So we can't pre-filter it until um, we're done with the experiment. Um, again, pre-filtering is where you do, like, um, like a pixel-to-pixel -pixel average. And you kind of redistribute, you know, between between adjacent pixels, um, which is, you know, it's a lot like binning. Um, post filtering is different, so that just changes the the final appearance. It doesn't actually alter the data itself. So, I mean, we could do this now if we wanted to. We could turn on the radio. I mean, you can see what it does, right? So, it's pretty dramatic here. And gallium is really weak. There we go. Okay. Yeah, sometimes, you know, when you have five elements, it gets it gets a little busy, uh, so to speak. So Yes, you can see like there you go. The phosphorus is clearly resolved. Um the indium is clearly also atomically resolved. Arsenic is atomically resolved, and so is the aluminum. And then what's really neat is we can overlay it with the Hadif image, and then it really kind of, you know, really stands out when you do it that way. Um, there is some additional uh, processing we can do that will help with this, actually. So we can manually adjust the, um, the contrast limits for the maps, and that will help quite a bit, actually. Yeah, so I mean, we could have, we maybe could have put the dispersion out to eight. I mean, we could have used just, you know, this end of the spectrum here, but, you know, I guess it's not too bad to have extra, extra X-rays to to work with, if you're so so inclined. I think when I did this before, I'm trying to remember. I don't exactly remember how I had the color scheme, but. It's okay. It's still good. It's really not. It's not showing a whole lot of damage. I mean, if you look here between measured and reference, it still looks it still looks pretty good. So, so I guess dropping the current down just you know it it helped enough. Okay, and I just made a little tweak to the focus. And our zone axis alignment is good. Yes, yeah, so this is a little busy with the five elements there. <laughs> yeah, five elements is a lot um, to put in one map, especially when you have like you know the the arsenic has overlap with pretty much everything, so that's a little bit much. Although it looks like the indium is. Okay, we can, sometimes the contrast, um, looks like the contrast is set pretty good there. That one is probably, okay, we can brighten that one up a little. That one looks okay. 
that one looks okay. So you can see here, so this is in counts, right? So you can see, right, we're going from zero, for, so this is the gallium one, so we're going from zero to not even one count here in, in this map, right? That's the dynamic range. Uh, I mean, the gallium is, is kind of weak overall. Uh, phosphorus is a little higher, right? Indium is a little bit higher. The arsenic is a little bit higher. The aluminum is a little bit higher, so. And I think, are we using the arsenic L? Yes, we are. So we could also use the gallium. So the gallium L, another thing we could do too, if we wanted to just look at the um, the signal in one of the peaks. So if we wanted to look at, say, the gallium um, K peak here, we put the range marker over the gallium K. So it's telling, we had about 20,000 here. If we then look at the gallium L right here, we can figure out how many. Yeah, so we've got quite a bit, you know, we've got more. So it probably makes more sense from, from a signal standpoint um, to switch the gallium to the L. And that's gonna give us, you know, yeah, some more. Yeah, so it bumped up our, our upper limit on the range here, so. All right, still looking good. Still not terribly damaged, so let it ride. Ah, okay. All right, so it looks like, so sometimes this happens um, if you go for a while and there's too much drift. It didn't seem like it was too bad, but it's basically saying I can't drift correct anymore, so it's stopping the experiment for us. All right, so, all right, let's see what we can do, um, do with this. So I had the sample in for a couple hours, so I thought it was gonna be enough, but you know, apparently it wasn't. All right, so what we can do now, um, some additional processing with this. So uh let's see scroll down here to quantification so again right um you can click auto empirical auto use background windows right click show windows again i already i already messed with this but um you can you can make sure that the windows make sense right they're not overlapping any of the peaks um especially down here in the lower energy this is where you know it, it can be a little tricky uh to do but you can manually, you know, adjust these. And actually that looks pretty good. Right click auto scale. Okay. And then down here, you wanna make sure, let me show windows. You wanna make sure you have use optimized fit. And then you wanna, so you can see I have the, the solid line over it, right? I can turn it off, turn it on. Okay, so you see it's conforming to the piece pretty good, but I can always tell it to remeasure. Give it a second here. It didn't really change much because it was already pretty good but then I can apply it to the spectrum image. Okay, so I'll give it a few seconds here. All right, and there we go. Okay, so now what we can do here to help us, okay, so if we, I shrink the size of the area I'm integrating. Let me turn off the maps here and just turn on the, the image. So if I shrink the size of the map here, or the size of the box I'm using to generate the spectrum, okay? So you can see here, I'm still kind of seeing a whole spectrum, okay? So this box is, how big is this? It's eight by eight. Um, what you can do here is you can shrink this until, see if I make one pixel, is that one? That's two by two. That's one by one. You can see one by one, I, I don't see a whole spectrum, right? Um, so this is too small. So what you can do is you can actually manually adjust this, I think. Yes, you can change this. You can go two by two. And then you can see, see I still don't have like kind of a spectrum. The idea behind this is you wanna increase the size of your um, box until you kind of see a 
you know, a spectrum, right? So it's, it's kind of starting there, but we could probably bump this up even to four by four. So now we have 16 pixels that we're integrating over. Oops. Oops. Okay, so that's a little bit better. So so what this tells me is we can we can pre-filter and, and do four pixels, okay? So that's like this four by four. So basically what it's gonna do is it's going to average um, over this four by four, right? And, you know, reassign that to the pixel in the middle, okay? Um, or it, it, it's kind of like binning, it's analogous to that. So we can set it for four and we can do pre-filtering like this. Okay, and so what we can see here is that it really kind of improved the, um, if we just turn off one of these or show one of the maps, let's show the gallium, whoops, the arsenic, okay? So this is with the pre-filtering. If I turn off the pre-filtering, right? So kind of improves the signal by doing that, okay? Um, and then the other thing too is the last thing is this post filtering. So now if you, you can click post filtering and if you have a crystalline um, sample, the radial wiener works really well for this, okay? So if we turn to just the arsenic, right? You can see off, on, off, on, okay? And then you can actually, so let's turn on the gallium with the, um, so I think the default here is 80. Okay, so that's actually not too bad. Um, the lower you make this number with the frequency, kind of the the smoother the you know the the appearance of it looks. So I think the default is 80 again. So if we actually, yeah, it's just a little it's a little busy with that many maps, but you can kind of see how that works. And then if we superimpose the um, the hat if on there works really well okay let's put this back uh, let me use the arsenic here okay let me put this at how's 50 look 40 okay yeah let's leave it at let's leave it at 40 okay one thing we can do though to help clean this up is we can bump up the black level Okay, so if we pull this up, it's going to help clear up. See, it's going to help give us a little more separation between the columns, right? Okay, so kind of like that. Okay, so you don't want to don't want to get too crazy with this, but something like about that, okay, because that really helps with that. Okay, we do the same thing for the indium, right? That's the indium right there. Now there actually is indium in here, so I don't want to do this to the point where like you don't see it in the middle because there is still indium there. That that's actually real. So we can bump this up just you know just a little just to kind of take that away. Okay, with the um, aluminum though, there's no aluminum in here in here. Okay, so we can something about like like that works well. Uh, phosphorus, same thing. There's no phosphorus in here. Okay. So we'll bump this up. Something about like so. And then the gallium. Same thing. Something about like that. Okay, so now if we overlay these, everything's a lot better separated, right? Just by bumping up the um, the black level. And then if we put the HADF image underneath it, I mean, that really, you know, makes it stand out here. Let me blow this up here so it's not in the way. Okay, so you can kind of see, I mean, it's pretty neat here, right? Um, so we can actually see the polarity here with the indium and the phosphorus, right? So if I turn off the phosphorus, you can see that to the left of every 
uh, or to the right, I should say, of the blue dots, which are indium, you're seeing the phosphorus, right? So we can, t we can see the polarity, right, of the material. Um, the same thing if we look at the, um, the, the in-gas, right? So the in-gas would be um, this stuff in here, I believe, right? So if, you, if we turn off the, the gallium, you can see the gallium, or the arsenic, I'm sorry, the arsenic is to the right here, okay, of the, of the other ones, okay? And then actually, and then if we superimpose it like this, it becomes even more obvious, right? It actually helps quite a bit to superimpose it over the stem image because it's, it's very obvious to see that way. Again, this is a little busy that we have, um, you know, four, four um, sorry, five elements to map like this, but that's what makes it kind of neat is that we can do this. Um, we can try messing with this radial filter a little bit more here to see if this helps. Okay, so that's a, probably a little too much smoothing. 540, and then that's probably a little too much. That was, yeah. So I mean, superimposing it with the HADF kind of helps quite a bit. I mean, we can do a little, we can do a little bit more with the pre-filtering if we want. At some point, like if you make this too big, it kind of just smears everything out. If we do six, which is what's recommended. Yeah, so it gets a you know gets a little bit too blurry that way. So I think four was probably better. And again, we probably could have counted for a little bit longer, but you know we, we ran out of uh, drift correction apparently. So, but yes, I mean we can we can see pretty clearly um, how powerful this is, right? So the individual maps here, we turn off the arsenic. So the arsenic is everywhere except for in the indium phosphide, right? So you can see um, see the atomic resolution that way. Turn off the individual ones, right? And then see that. Okay. Okay. So um, that's the atomic resolution. Now, um, I'm what I mentioned before, though, um, is you know we're in nanoprobe mode, right? And we have a you know a one uh, probably even less than that now because we dropped the current, right? I mean, if we calculate the current here, 100 picoamps. Um, it's telling us we, you know, we have a 110 picometer probe here. Okay, so, you know, we're deep into the atomic scale. Um, you don't, if you're not mapping at a scale like this. So let's say, for instance, let me go back here. Okay, and let me start. Oops, close the column valves. Um, open. Oh, I had it set to close the column. I don't normally do that, but that's okay. Okay. Um, let's say, for instance. I want to map at a scale. Uh, let's see here, something like this, right? So I mean, you know, so the the one thing I forgot to mention. So the pixel size of your image here that that's the pixel size in um, your EDS map. Okay, so you know you, you can uh, you can adjust your magnification, keeping nothing else or keeping everything else the same, and that will you know, dictate what you see. Um, but um, if you want to map at a scale like this, so uh, my pixel size now is about three quarters of a nanometer, okay? I can't really see atomic level detail now, okay? Um, if I wanted to just map like these quantum well structures like this and maybe, you know, you know maybe map something like this, um, Using nanoprobe mode is maybe it may be kind of unnecessary almost in a sense um, and a little bit of overkill um, to do that. You know, my opinion is that you only really need to use nanoprobe mode on a corrected tool when you're doing like atomic res um, mapping. OK, so one thing we can do is we can switch up our microscope here. And we can do EDS mapping in STEM microprobe mode. So we'll go over vacuum. We'll pause this. Okay. Go ahead and okay. So it automatically closed these anyway. 
Uh, normally you want to close it manually. Okay, but we're, what we're going to do now is go back to the stem tab, not the stem tab, sorry, the beam tab, um, expand the panel, click free control, and then we can switch from nanoprobe to microprobe. Okay, so now your objective lens is set to your value that you're in like normal TEM microprobe. Okay, um, this convergence angle is not accurate. Okay, there isn't like a way to to do this or configure this to be accurate. There isn't like an alignment. My experience is that this is about half the actual value. When you measure it, it's really about three and not one and a half, okay? Um, when we switch to microprobe though, we have to redo some of the alignments, okay? So, um, and then one thing too, of course, is it went to a different spot size. So I'm gonna bump the spot size back up to six, which is what we were doing before, okay? Um, let me go back out of diffraction and into image mode. And now because we're in microprobe, uh, we don't have to use S-Core to do any of the alignments. Okay, so that kind of simplifies things. Okay, let me take the detector out. Okay, there's the beam. So I'm using the ball to recenter this. Okay, so my C2 aperture centering is still good. Okay, my focus knob when I'm in stem microprobe, um, th this is only controlling the um, um, the C3 lens, as you can see. Okay, it's not controlling the objective in, in stem microprobe. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to expand this and I'm going to make an adjustment with my monochromator. So we were in positive focus here um, when we were doing nanoprobe, but I'm going to put this into negative focus, which is what we typically use when we're in like TEM microprobe. And so since we have the same condenser configuration, I'm gonna use the same configuration here. We're gonna bump this back up to negative 40. Okay, so I've got, okay, so my current's a little bit higher than what I had. So to keep the current the same, why don't we go ahead and we'll drop this? Uh, no, nah, we'll leave it. Uh, we'll leave it there. Okay. Okay. So we've got that set. Okay. My samples on the bottom. So let me go ahead and. Okay. There we go. I had the scan rotation on, so that threw me off here. Okay, so there's the um, the Fib Platinum. Okay, so the alignments we need to do here. Okay, so with the beam expanded like this, you wanna focus the image like you would be in TEM mode. Okay, so something about like this, like minimum contrast. So we were pretty close before, but you know, a little, a little bit off. And then again, with your beam expanded, you can find tune and Rotation center objective. Now the beam may shift when you do this, so you gotta bring it back over here and then mag back in. Okay, so we can see we got some shifting here. So you're gonna use your multifunction knobs to minimize this. Okay, perfect. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a couple things here. So we're going to get the probe focused here and it looks a little astigmatic. So we're going to click condenser here in stigmator and we're going to make sure we're nice and circular. good okay and then we're going to click intensity list focus and bring this to a point okay again we're only doing this in stem microprobe i wouldn't adjust this in stem nanoprobe and click done and then we'll turn diffraction on 
Again, I know from experience, because I've measured this, this is actually about three millirad and not 1.5. So if we go to S core here, we can actually figure out the probe size. So if we put in three and we put in 382, click update. So even still, we're, we're at about 1.2 nanometer probe, okay? So even though it's called micro probe, right, we're still, you know, deep in the nanometers here. Okay, put that in, go to acquisition, and we'll click start. Okay, so now, so now we're not doing atomic resolution now um, when we're in STEM nanoprobe. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm focusing with... Um, with the Z here as best I can. Uh, stem auto tuning not going to work now. So what you have to do here is you have to use your. Whoops, that was way too coarse. You have to use your condenser and just look at the image. I mean that looks good. I'm not. There's really nothing left to adjust, so it looks fine. If this was still off, you would go to tune and use condenser stigmator. Okay, but we're going to go find the area where we did the analysis just a minute ago. Come on, where are you? There we go. Okay, so there's the now the question is, can we find the spot that we were just looking at? I mean, it had a little bit of a burn mark, so maybe we can locate it again, if we're lucky. Ah, I think it was there. There we go. Okay, I see it right there. Okay, because I know the zone axis alignment is good in the vicinity here. Okay. Okay, so I can still resolve the quantum wall structure here pretty good. Okay, I mean, you know, it's not it's not perfect, but I mean, because you know we have a, a bigger probe, but it's still you know resolvable, so to speak. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and my pixel size. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so my pixels, uh, one more click. Okay, so my pixel size now is um, a little bit less, a little bit more than half of my probe size. Okay, so this is probably, um, there's really not much benefit to going higher than this um, given the probe size. So um, at least in terms of the pixel resolution. So let me go ahead and turn on my my shutters or open my shutters for the super x okay and same thing here now even though we don't have atomic resolution you can leave this checked it's not going to hurt anything um okay we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll do yeah we'll do the same thing it's about three seconds of frame this isn't quite the same scale so all right and uh let's see what we get here let's see if we can resolve these and actually, maybe to save us a little bit of, well, let me, let me bump this up a little more. A few seconds. Uh, okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Right, let me turn off the filtering. So, I mean, some of these quantum well structures, I mean, these are really, really fine, right? These are just like a few, you know, unit cells. So, I mean, you can see here, just looking at like the aluminum, right? I mean, we're resolving that um, quantum, quantum well structure um, pretty obviously here. 
I mean, if I add these all together, yes, yeah, so you can see it coming through there. You can see it coming through there with the aluminum. Um, is it using the same? Yeah, so it's using the same settings we had before. Shouldn't have the same issues with drift correction that we did before. Uh, let's see, is it doing? Okay, so it's still doing automatic here. So I'm getting um, some better signal now. Part of that, of course, is my current is a lot higher. Um, and I'm sampling a little more volume than it was, right, versus when I was in nanoprobe mode. So like you can see here, my, um, yeah, I'm already, you know, close to three quarters of a million. Um, when your probe is, is you know, you know, 100 and, and uh, 20 or 110 pico, pico uh, meters, you know, the volume that you're exciting x-rays from is a lot smaller than when it's, you know, 10 times as big, right? So that, that's part of it as well. Um, you are going to get better signal in microprobe mode just because you're, you know, exciting a bigger volume. So we're already, we're already close to a million counts here and we haven't even gone two and a half minutes. So yes, so if you're not doing anything at the atomic uh, level, um, I would encourage you to do, you know, microprobe STEM um, for your mapping, okay? Because it works really well. Um, it's very easy to align, right? You don't have to use the corrector for anything. Um, and I mean, you can see here, you know, if we, if we look just at the, some of these structures here, if we do a, I mean, some of these, these are, you know, just, less than two nanometers, right? Or maybe even a nanometer. Um, and, it, and it's resolving them in um, in STEM microprobe, no problem. Again, part of that is because we do have the CS correction. Uh, we are getting a little bit of a benefit from that, even though the convergence angle is smaller, okay? So three millirad convergence angle, you know, with CS correction is still better than three millirad with no CS correction, okay? But you can see it very plainly there. Um, the post filtering radial is not going to help us much here because this is not atomically resolved. So, I mean, if we turn this on, well, it actually does help quite a bit. <laughs> actually, I mean, we have a periodic structure here. I mean, normally this helps a lot with the um, with the atomic level, but I guess because this is periodic, um, yeah, that actually worked pretty well. So, uh, usually for something like this, I actually prefer to use um, to use Gaussian. Uh, blur for this instead and then just do you know some some pixel averaging you can see what happens though like when we don't have any phosphorus here when I turn on the um, and this was in the previous map right if you turn on like you end up seeing phosphorus where you don't have any okay so that's why you have you have to be careful with this post filtering because sometimes it can give you the appearance of signal where you don't have any. Um, so it's just something you kind of have to be cognizant of. But yeah, you can kind of see here. I mean, that's pretty dramatic, pretty dramatic, all things concerned. I mean, all things considered, right? So there's your indium, aluminum, gallium. Um, it actually works pretty well to show all that. So. I mean, if we look at the FFT from the structure, yeah, I mean, because we have, you know, we have the periodicity here, that's probably why the radial uh, wiener works pretty good, okay? Because it's meant specifically for um, for periodic structures, and so that's clearly what we have, right? But we'll leave this with the Gaussian blur for now. All right, so what do we got here? We have almost 2 million, almost 2 million counts in about a third of the time. Really no damage. So, I mean, and yeah, so when the probe is bigger like this too, um, you're not causing as much damage either, right? That that you're getting with like, you know, the angstrom level probes with the, with the high current, right? Because your current density is not as high anymore. Um, so, you know, another advantage to microprobe um, is just sample damage, right? You just don't have the same issue that you do have um, 
with the with the atomic uh, level. So why don't we run this? Let's run this till we get uh, three million counts. See, this is now it's saying, right, you only need to do a two pixel average here for the pre-filtering. Okay, so I mean, we're already getting a, you know, a good number of counts here. Um, but we'll wait till this is done here. Anyways, we'll wait till we hit, till we hit three million, and then we'll stop it. We'll do a little filtering and uh, make some nice maps. But yeah, you can see, I mean, these are, you know, these quantum well, these are like one one nanometer about, right? And we're resolving them fine in microprobe. So with these, because we don't have the, I mean, that's another thing. Like, I, um, if you do the radial filter, you know, bumping up the black level tends to be more of, you know, more necessary. Um, it doesn't tend to be as much of an issue with the Gaussian blur when you do that as the post filtering, right? You're not seeing extra phosphorus here that you were with the with the radial filter. Okay, so there's less less need to fudge with the contrast limits if you do a Gaussian blur. Um, but this doesn't work as well when you're when you're talking about like atomic level detail, so. Are we close? Oh, almost. Yep, only eight minutes. All right, why don't we go ahead and stop it? So we'll come back here. Um, normally, I don't have this close. I don't have this checked. I just have beam blank checked, so it'll blank the beam when it's done. Okay. So just like we did before, empirical auto use windows, and we can check and see what we got here. That one's kind of spurious. Modeled. Otherwise, it looks good. Uh, show windows, use optimize fit, free measure, and then apply to SI. So once you fudge with the background windows, this auto isn't checked anymore. That's that's normal. Okay, and so this is without any uh, pre-filtering. Um, and, and we're seeing, you know, every, this looks really good. So, um, but let's pre-filter it. Okay. So we'll do two pixels, like it's saying. Yeah, and that improved things quite a bit. So we still have the Gaussian on. I mean, if we turn the Gaussian off, it still looks pretty good. But we'll leave it on there. So, so we can see. But, you know, fudging with the black level may help here anyway, anyway just because um, the, this is a little too busy with the three elements here. So, I mean, if we if we bump this up here to kind of, yeah, something like that. Something like that. Okay, so there's no gallium up here. Um, oops, wrong one. Come on. There we 
go. And just a little bit here. Okay, so now if we overlay these, yeah, so it's not quite as saturated now. Even though it's still pretty saturated, just because we have that. And if we overlay it with the with the stem image, it looks okay. So, yeah, I mean that's just unfortunately when you have that much going on in the map. I mean th this arsenic is everywhere. If the arsenic was kind of more separated from um, the aluminum and the gallium and the indium, it it might not be quite as you know overwhelming. But um, it just happened to work out that way. So, right, and you put it there. So. But if you just do these, right, it looks pretty good. Okay, so that's um, that's STEM microprobe and um, its application as well. So, I mean, you know, we have no problem resolving features that are close to a nanometer scale. Now, the other thing, too, this is a perfect example to, to demonstrate this. Um, and let me put this in here. So if you want to extract line scan data here, okay, click processing profile, okay, and then you can extract a line scan. So you want, if you hold down shift, that will keep it horizontal. Um, and then over here in object properties, you can increase the integration width like this, right? Which works great for a structure like this. Okay, so we have net, so that's what's gonna show up here. Okay, but you can see pretty clearly, right? The, you know, undulation here if I go down to one you can still kind of see it but it's kind of noisy but you know again if you if you um, integrate this over a large number right you end up with something that is a little more statistically significant so you can see like how the arsenic really you know just kind of drops off and then the phosphorus kind of goes from nothing to up there so right because we don't expect there to be um, arsenic in the phosphide and phosphide in the arsenide um, but yeah, you can see the the same thing, the undulation with the with the three elements here. So you can even push this all the way, right? So it's just across. So this is doing like an average, actually, an average across the line, because the the numbers aren't getting any bigger, right? Like there, it's, the numbers really aren't any different. So so this is like an averaging effect, is what it's doing. It's actually not an integration. Technically, it's an averaging. And let's do 100, just a nice round number. And there you have it. So, um, all right. So, as always, um, you have questions, please let me know. Um, you saw kind of some of the issues with this. So, you know, sometimes things don't go perfectly smoothly. Um, we did run out of drift with that um, atomic res one, which is not uncommon, right? Especially when you're at a scale uh, that fine. So, you know, the drift correction becomes pretty critical at that point. So, uh, let me go ahead here. Yeah, we turn off the arsenic, then it it shows it much better. Actually, let me switch this. Let me switch the phosphorus to green. And let me switch it. Maybe if we put it like that, does it look a little? No, no. sorry, magenta. Does it look a little better? Yeah, it's still a little overpowering. So, but it's not bad. Not bad otherwise. What if we do this yellow? Yeah, that's not bad that way either. So. Again, red, green, blue, those should be your 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 most important ones, right? Um, so actually probably these three should be, oops, we already have red and green. Yeah, so that looks a little more striking. I mean, from here, I mean, if we do the phosphorus that way, you know, the, phosphor, the arsenic is a little much there. So what about gray? Well, that's not too bad actually, to put the gray in there. White, no. Yeah, there's really not a good one to overlay it with here. So the gray is not too bad, actually, truth be told, but kind of defeats the color, the purpose of having a color mix at that point. So, yeah, the yellow is too much. So I'd probably leave that out of the composite, um, quite frankly. So we just leave it like this. So, okay. All righty. So that's going to conclude the demo and the tutorial. Uh, once again, you have any questions, please let me know. Um, when you're done doing EDS, actually, before I do this, okay, so the, de the detector windows will close automatically after a while, but it's always best 
you know, close them yourself right? when, when you're done. Don't just leave them open like that, okay? Um, and then if you're in, um, if you're in microprobe mode in STEM, if you go, so let's zero the scan rotation actually, like we should. Uh, blank, so why is it not letting me adjust the scan rotation? Okay, there we go. Zero, zero the scan rotation. Okay, if you go out of STEM mode and you're in microprobe STEM, um, the next time you go back into STEM, I believe it will default back to nanoprobe, even if you left it coming out of, I mean, we can check it and see. Yeah, so it goes back into, or does it? Let me see. Uh, okay, now you have to click, yeah, so you have to click probe when you go back in. Um, before you swap out, otherwise it doesn't go back to the normal probe. It goes it goes back to stem, but it, as you saw here, it had the angle range is different than um, different than normal, which is what it normally is. Ha ha. Okay, uh, that's another discussion about what this means at some point later. So, anyways, all right. So we'll go ahead and swap out of stem. All right. And that's the end of that. So we'll go ahead and close this up. All right, so that's the end of that. Let me go ahead and stop the video and I will see you guys again soon.